He is a physician. He's a cardiologist, in fact. He's dedicated his life to the betterment of human health and to encouraging people to know Jesus, the great physician. He has also dared to write some things that have shaken up the establishment. His name is Dr. James Markham. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is our conversation. Dr. Jim Markham, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate you taking your time. Well, it's my pleasure, and I know we have so much to talk about today, but I, I want to thank you for allowing me to be here with you and also for you know playing some of the programs we've made in the past. We've thank aired, you for doing we, that. We continue to air many of your programs, and, and they're great. And we are, you know, just being gracious and thankful is so important to a physiology. Yeah. Hey, I want to get to that. First, yeah. I'm going to start talking about you, or I want you to talk about you. So uh, t tell me where you're from and, and where you were raised. Well, I live in the Chattanooga area. Is that where, is that where you started out? No. Well, I was born in East Tennessee, so okay. I've always been from this area. Yeah, sure. And um, we've been practicing cardiology here. I've actually practiced for over 30 years. How did you get into cardiology? Well, first, why medicine? Somewhere along the line, you wore a younger man's clothes and you yeah. said, I'm going to be a doctor. Well, why? Well, what happened to me, John, is when I was about seven years old. At that time, our family lived in Florida. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, I was one of these kids that liked to climb trees. And I was climbing a tree one day, the day after Thanksgiving in the early 70s. I fell out of the tree and broke my arm. Ah, okay. And I had the type of fracture where the, the bones were like this. Ooh. Back then, we used to put traction to try to loosen the muscles so the bones would align so they can heal. Yeah. Bones have to be in alignment to heal. We call that setting a bone. But back in the 70s, they used traction. So back then, they used a lot of traction on my arm, and unfortunately, they used too much, oh. and it was like a tourniquet. And um, I can remember being under a lot of pain, and the next day, of course, I had um, gangrene oh, wow. in, in my arm and fingers. And my dad said, that's probably not the best place to stay. So he took me to a different hospital. And then through a series of operations, anointings, and prayer, um, God was able to heal me in his way. Mm. And I'm still one of the few men in America that has a tan in the bottom of their skin and can grow hair in the bottom of skin. And through all of that, I still, I lost the tips of three fingers ah, from gangrene. Sure. Yeah. And if you see this brown spot, yeah. this is um, a skin graft from my leg. Yep. And I grow hair out of that. You do. And you don't see that every, every day. No, you don't. And I don't really advertise it. Let's shake hands here. Yeah. See, I, I always reach under. Ah, uh, there you go. So I would not let people know I had that for years. Yeah. But God, looking back over time, God used that to propel my interest in medicine sure. and healing. Yeah. And from that point on, I had that desire. And I had to go through all the physical therapy and rehabs and five operations. I still can't rotate my arm because it never healed correctly. Interesting. Yeah. But through that experience, I think that's where it started at age seven, yeah. interesting me in the field of medicine. So how did you get from there to specializing in cardiology? Yeah, so I went through and did all the different things and I did my undergraduate at the University of Texas in Austin. Uh -huh. And from there, I moved to University of Texas Medical School and studied there. And for a while, I thought I wanted to do orthopedics, sure. you know, fix bones and that. Yeah. But one day I was in the operating room and the doctor said, Jim, just hit it harder. And I felt like it was more construction, yeah. you know? Oh, and yeah. I said, I don't yeah. know. And by then I'd gotten married and my wife says, well, why don't you do internal medicine till you figure this out? So I spent three years doing internal medicine on the East Coast. And there I met some wonderful mentors. Mm. And these stories are long, but one of my mentors was the father-in-law of Dr. Oz, okay, oh, in the Philadelphia that? area, yeah. Dr. LaMole. So through the influences there, I said, well, cardiology is really something I wanna do because you get to work with your hands still, yeah. and I wanted to continue to work with my hands as well as make diagnosis and work with people. 
And so that period of time, I decided to go into cardiology, and then I did another fellowship at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, sure, great which, you're, place. which you're familiar oh, yeah, with. What a city. And I spent years there, and then, then after that, I, I was trained as a general cardiologist. Okay. But back 30 years ago, we didn't have near the technology. Yeah. We did not have defibrillators. We did not have stents. We did not have valves from the groins. Hold up. Just 30 years ago, there were no stents. No, we did angioplasties, uh -huh. but we did no stents. When people had a heart attack, we used to give special medicine called a thrombolytic yep. that would break it apart. And then we moved into this, this balloon angioplasty yeah. era. Then that didn't work so good. And then we have been developing stents and perfecting that for heart attacks ever since. Well, let me ask you, you, you talked about losing the end of three fingers. Was that ever a challenge or a difficulty in I well, mean, well, cardiology yeah, can be pretty hands-on depending on what you're doing. It was on other people's eyes. For instance, ah. I really wanted, I really thought at one time I wanted to be a cardiovascular surgeon. Sure. Those are the ones that cut you open and, and you know, move things around inside you. But they said, nah, they probably won't let you do that. But you can work from outside, you know, through little motions with catheters and looking at screens, yep. seeing where things go. You know, we can put pacemakers in, angioplasties, angiograms, things like that from outside in. So that's what I, I thought, well, if I can't do this, let me do this. But hearts always interest me. Yeah, how fascinating. Always interest okay, me. Okay, let me ask the doctor. I've got a question for the doctor. What, as a cardiologist, do you wish people either knew regarding their heart health or perhaps they already know, but they're not doing? Give me, give me, give me three things. Here are three things I wish people would do to look after their heart? Well, the first thing is something that you're probably not expecting, okay. okay? But the key to heart health, period, is Christ. Why in the world would you say that? I would say that. Well, Christ, first of all, is our ultimate healer. Sure. So let's say we have some bad genetics in our family, we store cholesterol, and we have a heart attack and pass away at a young age. Mm -hmm. And that still happens. Let's say bad things happen. Um, myocarditis, an sure. infection of the heart, um, things like that happen. Well, as long as we have Christ as our basis, we know that this world is not our home, we're just passing through. We're gonna have healing, it's just where, when, and how. That faith takes away fear and anxiety, which raises adrenaline and cortisol, which stresses and age our body. That's interesting, yeah. And it also, that relationship through the Holy Spirit, gives us the power to do things and see things and make decisions for the right reasons, mm -hmm. which is to glorify God. Right. So when you know Christ, the Holy Spirit helps you with your health in all aspects, guarantees your healing forever. That is the most important thing I want someone to know now and forever. Yeah, amen. So I start with that. Okay, okay. But other things. Yeah, give me two you know, more. Yeah, just simple, simple things like, Eating vegetables, you know, eating vegetables. Vegetables have greens with nitric oxide, which makes the arteries bigger, healthier. The organ I treat is that inside lining called the endothelium. Sure. That goes everywhere. Well, we know greens really make that healthier. And a lot of people don't eat greens with nitrates in them anymore. You know, uh -huh. they eat everything else. Just something simple as eating a salad every day yeah. is a big help. And another big thing is move the body parts. Uh-huh. We are not moving like we did 300 years ago. Uh -huh. We sit, we sit at computer desks, we don't move. But when we move, the blood flows against the endothelium, makes it healthier, brings oxygen throughout the body, helps our metabolism so we don't store as much fat in the body and keeps our body from aging. Now, you know if we sit here long enough, our bodies are gonna get stiff. Yep. That's called oxidation. Mm -hmm. It's aging us. The same thing happens on the inside of our blood vessels throughout the whole body. So if you don't use it, you lose it. You lose so it. just something simple as eating greens, moving, and we could go on down the list with water, the words, every input that's out there changes our physiology. Now I'm gonna pick up on something you, you just threw away, but first yeah. I'm gonna notice something. You might have said exercise, instead you said movement. Yes. Why did you distinguish between the two? That was, that was, yeah. that was deliberate, why? Well, through my 30 years of practice, a lot of people, when you hear exercise, 
it stresses them. Sure. That they get, I can't do that. You know, I'm in a wheelchair. I can't exercise. Okay. But you can still move, whether that's moving your arms, deep breathing, walking instead of driving, you know, going up the stairs instead of elevators. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you can schedule regular movement or exercise on a treadmill or whatever you works that's for you, too. that's yeah. great. But I don't want to intimidate people. We want to empower them. Yeah. You know, to get going and doing things. And that's why we use the word, I use the word movement, because, you know, some people think all we need to do is walk on a treadmill, yeah. but you need to move all the parts. And as we get older, you know, as I've come into the sixth decade of life, I have to stretch more than ever, because if I don't stretch, I get, so I uh -huh. spend five or 10 minutes just going through a stretching routine and light weights, then the aerobics. So that's why I use the term movement. There was something else you said, and you just kind of threw it away a moment ago. And I don't want to, I don't want to distract us, but I want to bring it back because someone is thinking, wait a minute, yeah. you said all these other things, you mentioned water and you mentioned the words you use. Yes. No one watching this program right now has ever heard a cardiologist refer to the importance of the words you use. Probably never heard a doctor. Yeah. So why did you say that the words you use have some kind of impact on health? Yeah. That's interesting. Well, let me build a context, John. Yeah. Every input we have changes our physiology. Okay. The words, the thoughts, the rest, the water, the food, the movement, the light, everything either makes us, improves our physiology or makes us worth. You follow me so far? Interesting, okay. yeah, and, and, of, and of course we've got to agree with so, that. So we have our genetics, the DNA, yep. and what the software that affects the hardware, that's called the epigenetics, sure. so to speak. Yeah. So oh. these lifestyle changes, these inputs can change our genes. If enough changes occur, mutations, we get a symptom. The mm -hmm. body malfunctions. When we get a symptom, we tend to go to the doctor. When we go to the doctor, we can treat a symptom or replace a part, but we usually do not get at the cause. Sure, that's true. Right. Yeah. So I go back to the Bible and I call it biblical prescriptions. God has given us things in the Bible throughout time that's our true source of authority. Sure, that's right. Medical books, you can't believe everything you hear out there. You know, there's biases, but there's the bias in the Bible by our Creator. He's going to tell us the truth every time. Right. So I go back to the Bible and try to find the physiology and let people use that to improve their health. Okay, words. So let's the words. Remember yeah. the text in Proverbs. I think it's Proverbs maybe 16, 24, where it talks about the words are like honeycombs. That's right. Sweet to the body, but healing to the bones. That's right. That's there. So. I went back and studied all of the studies that are out there about words. And people that, and there's a great book by Andrew Newberg, How, how Words Affect Your Brain. Mm. So he actually looked at different words and phrases and studied the parts of the brain and he looked at how it turned on and off. But words like, if I say stuff like, John, you are the best looking man I've ever seen. Well, okay. You know, I, I, I love what you say. I hear that a lot. Yeah, you do oh, such yeah. good work, John. I hear that a lot, but you know, the good looking part, I, 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 I like love that. the way you, you take care of this ministry. Oh, okay. You just do a great job. Yeah, I feel, yes, I feel better. Yes, you can do this. I feel better already. But you know, but those positive words, those affirming words, yep. change the physiology. You make less of the stress chemistry, the part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex, turns on, the stress part of the brain called the amygdala turns down, uh -huh. but also when I say bad words to you. Now, I'm not gonna say that. Okay, good. Even, even when I do that, it turns on that. You make chemicals like epinephrine, adrenaline that raises your blood pressure, increases the chance of you having a heart attack, damages our immune system, causes us not to sleep good at night, makes inflammation in the body so we get stiff to some degree. So negative words, and I think we've seen that anyone in an abusive relationship, sure, absolutely. their health's affected. Sure. Something's going on inside, whether yep. it causes inflammation in the brain, neurotransmitters causing depression, feeling good, not sleeping well, hurting their blood pressure, the immune system. So words, not only the words you use, but the words you receive change your health. Mm. So what I've been trying to do to help my understand this and use it better, I've been looking at the red letter words in the Bible. Amen. This is how Christ communicated and talked. 
And the more I can understand how he uses words, the better I can incorporate that so I can improve my health, just improving the way I use words. And if I'm around people that say bad words, I want to try to extricate myself from those situations because they're affecting my health, whether I like it or not, especially negative words. That's right. So that's why I don't watch much news anymore. Man, those guys, John, I don't know if you watched them, but they're not very positive. No, they are not. No, they are not. That's really interesting because what you, by, by, by connecting that with the Bible and principles we can understand, of course. Yeah. Of course. And you know, you do know, the Bible speaks a lot about the sort of words we should use uh, in the New Testament, encouraging us to, to use sound speech which cannot be condemned. Yes. And so forth. Okay, so that's really interesting. So it's interesting when you think about words as a prescription, yeah. as well as words, you use the right words and you can help heal people. Yeah. Be thankful in all things, you know, even our trials and tribulations. So words are a way to treat and they're also a way to help prevent disease. Yeah. So you, you train as a physician, internal medicine, cardiology, but here you are you talk more about the Bible perhaps than, than anything when it comes to health. Yeah. How do you get from you know, medical school to this place now in your, in your orientation where for you the Bible has become a significant part of a healing regimen? How do you make those discoveries? What nudged you in that direction? Well, it started again from our story earlier on. I was anointed by physicians yeah. at one time. They thought I might lose my arm. Mm. But I still think God chose not a route. And if he had chose that for me, I would have accepted that as part of his will and tried to use that to glorify him the best I could. Sure. But he did not choose that. So he gave, I think, a divine miracle at that point in my life. So I knew that there was more than healing than what physicians could do. Mm. Physicians can help, but there was more to healing. Healing came from God. And I had that ingrained in me at a young age. So even as I went through medical school and cardiology fellowship, I knew that modern medicine could treat symptoms, but our ultimate purpose in healing was something so much more. Mm. And I think people want to hear this. They want to have that hope. They want to know that, you know, there's more than our bodies here and the health we have here. Yeah, yeah that's so interesting. Do people know that? Generally, no. Do Christians know that generally? Yeah. Well, I don't think so. Okay. okay? I, I'm able to minister to many groups, and some people do not correlate their health and the way they take care of their bodies yeah. and their lives and all of these inputs with their spiritual life. Interesting. But you know, in the Proverbs, in all ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. That's right. So a lot of people now, since we've had the pandemic, since we have, when they have their own health problem, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden they start looking for answers. And they say, hey, what can I do to have healing? Where should I go for truth? You know, where do I go? What do I do? Mm. Where do I start? Mm, fantastic. Well, I'd like to ask you another question, but I'm gonna pause and ask this yeah. question on the other side of the break because you're an author, you've written several books. One of them, a book called Medicines That Kill. Now. It's fascinating that a physician would write a book called Medicines That Kill. So in a minute, we're going to ask you about this. I'm going to ask you, are you anti-medication? I think I already know the answer, but I want to hear you say that. And I also want to ask you, what in the world are these medicines that kill? How does that happen and occur? So we're going to be back in just a moment with Dr. Jim Markham. I am John Bradshaw. And this is our conversation brought to you by It Is Written. Well, it is time for a new quarter of Sabbath school. And this quarter, we are looking at a fascinating book of the Bible. It is the book of Ephesians. And to guide us through this quarter study is the author of this quarter study. And that is Dr. John McVeigh. He's the president of Walla Walla University. John, tell us a little bit about what this quarter, the book of Ephesians is all about. Well, the book of Ephesians is about Jesus. It's Christ saturated. It tells us about God's grand plan to unite everything in Jesus Christ. And it invites us to live lives of significance by connecting with God's great plans and behaving in ways that enhances 
unity in the church, unity in our local congregation, unity in our family. If you want to better understand the book of Ephesians and God's plan for your life, make sure you catch new episodes every week and you can watch archived episodes at It Is Written TV. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. It is my good fortune to be speaking today with Dr. Jim Markham, who is a cardiologist. He's a television host. He is an author and he's written, among other things, a book called Medicines That Kill. Jim, Medicines That Kill. I mean, look, is that just a, a clickbait title where you're trying to grab people's attention? Well, yes, I wanted to grab people's attention because I think people needed to, ha to be aware that medicines have its place, but medicines can also be dangerous. Are you anti-medication? No, okay. I'm not. But remember, medications haven't been around for years and years and years. True remember, enough. in the old days, we had natural remedies. We had you know, ways people took care of themselves. Then we had a whole new industry develop. And some of those medications were very useful, especially things that would put people to sleep for surgery. Antibiotics were very useful. Um, medicines that would stop bleeding were very useful. But through the years, a lot of people said, well, you know, we just want to take medicines forever and ever. Yeah. And I've been around long enough that I've seen lots of medicines that were on the market that were taken off the market because they did dangerous things. Mm -hmm. Antibiotics that were pulled, certain types of anti-inflammatories that have been pulled off the market. So, and also we see that medicines taken inappropriately yep. can also cause problems. So this, this book came about right when, when a lot of narcotics mm -hmm. were being written for. Oh, 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 and history has demonstrated yes, that a lot narcotics of, were pushed and yes. basically, basically started an, 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 an addiction epidemic. Right, and a lot of people were having chronic pain. Yeah, that's and right. And because of that chronic pain, doctors kept giving medicines and medicines. Then we found out that it was terribly addicting, and then one thing led to another. They started taking these medicines, and it caused catastrophic physiologic consequences. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was part of it, and then a lot of times we just, we weren't getting at the cause of disease. Mm -hmm. You know, we say, hey, and all of the medicines, no matter, every medicine that I know has side effects. Yes, yeah, sure. Some have more side effects than others. So every medicine out there, we have to talk about the risk and the benefits. Mm -hmm. The rhythms that I use for heart rhythms, if taken inappropriately, can kill a person. Antibiotics, if you have an anaphylactic reaction, especially we see that occasionally with penicillin, that can cause a death as well. Mm. If you take too much narcotics, we've talked about that. So any medicine can be lethal if we don't take it correctly. And sometimes in the manufacturing, it gets to the market and we don't find out that it's a problem until it's been out there. Then we say, oh, wow, we get a problem. Let's take Vioxx off the market. Mm -hmm. Let's take Fin Fin off the market. Even though it helps people lose weight, it's destroying people's heart valves. Right. We didn't find that out. And yet people jump on these, we market these, and yet we don't understand the full knowledge of how these can. So medicines can kill you. But that wasn't the real reason I wrote the book. Yeah, okay, two things. One, it occurs to me too that a lot of the most popular medications today are for diseases that can be avoided. Secondly, I wanna ask you, give me an example. Can you give me an example of a situation where you've seen in somebody's life, they started innocently taking a medication and it just blew up on them? Yes, yes. Give me, give me, give me a, well, a, a story instance, as far as you can. We know that type 2 diabetes is a big deal. Sure. Okay. Big, yeah. And that's because we have too much fat in our bodies. Usually, we make too much blood sugar, okay, and we have to get rid of that blood sugar. Well, a lot of people think the only way to treat that is with medication. Sure. But if you get at the cause, if the cause is not exercising in fat, you remove those, you don't have to take the risk of a medication. Mm -hmm. So I've known several patients through the years that continue to take more and more pills for diabetes. And let's say what happens to them, they get dehydrated. They don't drink enough water. Or they go to a place where it's real hot. Then all of a sudden their kidneys can't get rid of the diabetic medicine that's already in their body. Mm. So a little bit of medicine becomes a lot of medicine. Then their blood sugar goes too low. And guess what happens? What happens? They die. You oh. can die from too low of blood sugar. You can go to what we call a diabetic coma. Sure. The blood sugar goes too low. You need blood sugar to work. 
you don't get blood sugar in the brain, the brain doesn't work. Yeah. So you need blood sugar. So that's just one example I've seen. And you could talk about all the medicines for high blood pressure. Mm -hmm, sure. So some and, people, and those are very popular. Yeah, so Who's some, not taking that? Some people take too many of them and it makes the blood pressure go too low. Uh -huh. Then they get up real cut, they get dizzy headed, they fall down, hit their head or break their, their hips. Then we have another problem. So medic medications can cause side effects, consequences um, that we're not aware of. Um, in the rhythm business, I give medicines for heart rhythms, and if we don't watch, these, rhythm, these medicines that control dangerous fast heart rhythms can also make the heart go too slow. Yeah. And also, the medicines, John, they interact with each other. Right. And these interactions can cause problems as well. So the more medicines you're on, the more side effects, the more interactions. And right now, most people, in, in the United States at least, are taking at least one medicine. Some people, as many as three prescription medicines. Hmm. And there's a place for that. But as a physician, I want to let them know about alternatives they can choose. Yeah. If they don't want to take the medicines, how to get off of them. And if they choose to stay on it, I want to educate them about the risk, benefits, and how to take these medicines correctly. That's what this book, Medicines That Kill, tried to do, yeah. to let people yeah understand that medications are a problem in itself. How rare is this? Because I know someone's thinking right now, oh yeah, he's just talking about taking too much or too little and I've got this under control. This is not rare no, that medications mess with it's people. It's not. And I did all of the research in the book and I added up all the deaths that occurred from medications. The ones that happened because medications were given inappropriately. Yeah. Mistakes were made. Mm -hmm. uh, medicines that were overdosed medicines that were interacting with each other, medicines that just cause what we call anaphylaxis. And that, if you added up all the causes of these deaths, that was the number one cause of death in America, killing more people in one year than even heart disease, which, which is which the number one cause. Which kills 600,000 people right, a year. Right, right, but no one wants to admit that, yeah. and it's a very hard statistic to get to the bottom of. So in the book, I tried to add up all of those different causes and give the numbers for our readers so they could understand, yes, we have a problem here. Medicines can kill. There's several questions I have to ask you. The first one that jumps to my mind is, how many people did you tick off? I mean, the, oh. dr the drug rep who came by your, 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 your practice probably wasn't thrilled that you were letting people know that medications may not be the only answer at all times. So did you rub some fur the wrong way? Yeah, well, I've believe it or not, I've rubbed fur the wrong way quite a few times in, my, in my life. Yeah. And they say if you're not rubbing some fur the wrong way and you don't have a little controversy going on, maybe you're not doing things right. Uh -huh. So yes, they were very unhappy, but they couldn't say too much because if they said too much, guess what? It gets yeah. more publicity. Right. Then people start hearing about it more. So I was more shunned than anything else. Interesting. Yeah, I was more, oh, don't pay attention to that. That's not important. But in that book also, I talked about spiritual things as well. Yep. So, yep. so yep. that's another thing. So, okay, someone's saying, yeah. oh, well, Martha, we, we take two medications each. Uh, uh, what do they do? They, you, you, they don't flush them down the toilet. No. Watch, and I think this is a fair question for anyone taking medication. They want to know they're taking the right medication in the right dose in the right way. They, let's say they want to check on that. Right. What should they do? Well, first of all, uh, you know, that's between, a lot between you and your physician who sure. knows why you're on it, the risk and benefits. So I would go to my doctor and say, listen, do I need this medicine? What are the risk and benefits? And also take it on yourself to read about it on the internet. There's lots of data out there. You can learn about your medicines. Go to programs like this where you can get a little bit more time to digest all of what's going on. Yep. Um, and then once you know the risk and benefits of medicine, ask your provider, is there anything that I can do to change my physiology, all of my physiology? There we go. And that's called holism. Remember, medicines are reductionalism. They're just changing one chemical pathway. But when we incorporate biblical prescriptions, we change the entire physiology. Yeah. So is there anything I can do to lower, to lower, to help my physiology so I don't need these medicines? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, but sometimes, John, people say, I just don't want to do that. Right. I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, I just don't want to do any of that, and that's okay, then they're gonna to have to um, have some element of risk. Because I think free will 
and choice is yeah, very important. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now you said, you know, a person will take it upon themselves, do some study, go on the internet. Now, you're an eminently balanced guy. You, you got decades in this. Your track record speaks for itself. You're not a crank on any level. But someone says, well, I went on the internet and I read that if, oh, I, yeah. if I just eat acai berries and all my problems are gonna go away. Yeah. What, what advice do you give how do we prevent people from turning into cranks? Well, what, what I, there's plenty of them. Well, you have to have a true north or authority in your life, okay. even as a doctor. You know, every 10 years, I've had to relearn everything. And I can't tell you right. how much it was appropriate 30 years ago that is not relevant now. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah so because medicine develops, right? Right, everything develops. There's always a truth learning curve that's going forward. So you have to have a place to start. Yeah. And that's why I went back to my source of authority, which is the Bible. Mm. So I go back to the Bible. If any of man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. That's I ask right. God for guidance. And I say, go back to the Bible to, to sort of get the balance of things. And then go to sources that you can trust after you go to the Bible where you can get a balanced approach. Now, certain things do help a little bit, but, but if you go back to the scriptures, the scriptures very much point to balance in life. Sure. And all things, you know, and it points to balance. And if you look at that big picture, you know, it's just not one food, it's everything together. It's just not one thought, it's all the thoughts. It's just not drinking a specific type of water, it's drinking water in general. It's not type of a specific exercise, it's moving in general. And as you go back and look at the way Christ lived, you say, well, Christ was all about balance and love yes. and these universal principles, um, these laws that govern the universe. Yeah, so, so, so you don't have a miracle cure to no, recommend somebody. No, there's some things that will help. Yep. Yes, I do have a miracle uh, cure, okay. but we've already talked about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And that miracle cure is having Christ in your life changing you and leading you along this path. Yeah. And I think if you go back and others, I'm not the only one that's saying this. People have said this for hundreds and hundreds of Here years, that the key to health is Christ, and Christ is the real healer that we have. Yeah. And as long as we have that, that's the place to start and let the Holy Spirit change you. And then you start doing things for the right reasons. You find truth in your life. And your path, John, might be different than my path. We all have different paths, but we just want to be going in, this, in the right direction. Yeah, amen. So you are very big on biblical prescriptions, so much so that you've written extensively about biblical prescriptions for health. I'd like to talk about that, and we, we're going to build on what we've discussed already. What's a biblical prescription for health? Okay. Well, I think the scriptures in themselves, of course, leads to ultimate healing. Sure. Okay, so that is the, the, the number one prescription we all want, that salvation that comes from faith, belief in Christ, and that power that comes from the Holy Spirit. So we want that. If we don't have that, it doesn't matter what we have. Sure. But if we look back, you know, some of the things that God says about, you know, he wasn't against the use of modern medicine. Right. You know, right. But, but he pointed to the big picture. So there is a place for modern medicine. They had healers at that time. Now, they weren't effective against things like leprosy and things of that nature, but they were good at certain things. So they had the place. In fact, Dr. Luke mm -hmm. was a very good mm -hmm. physician that eventually transitioned with Paul into evangelism. That's right. So, so Luke was a very good physician, and he, he helped people as much as he could. So there's a place for modern medicine. But within that, Christ taught that there was a reason that we, we have health problems to begin with. We have bad genes. You know, we, we've been separated from the original right. plan. Sin has brought yes, all this about. Yes, but things as simple as understanding, well, what, what were some of the diet recommendations? We talk in Genesis at Creation Week that he says, let me give you plants. In Genesis 1, the sixth day of creation, he says, let me give you plants to eat. And now studies have shown that people that eat plants, fresh food that grows, that grows do better. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a biblical prescription. Amen. We found out that people that walk, he recommended walking places, and they did better. No, we didn't have cars and too many, but those people do better. Yep. People that are outside instead of inside do better. People that drink water do better. People that use kind words do better. Uh -huh. People that have a merry heart. Remember, a merry heart does good like, like medicine. medicine. Yep. People that have purpose in life, work, something to do, mm -hmm. they do better from a health purpose. People that know how to rest, whether it be a weekly rest 
or a um, nightly rest. They do better, yeah. right. So all of those are biblical prescriptions that help you start to see the big picture, but empower you to know when our genetics break down where we should go. You know, you mentioned, I asked you about biblical prescriptions. You just recited, rattled off four, five, six, seven things just like that. You know what's interesting? Every one of them that you mentioned is life-changing. Yes. But every one of them, Jim, is simple and not one of them costs you 10 cents. And not a lot of side effects other than maybe not wanting to do it, maybe being inconvenienced. Sure. But John, where do you get the power to do that? Okay, now let's talk about that because you right. know there are people like, well, we've been trying to get around to moving or exercising. Yeah. We don't. So, so let's talk about that. Now, 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 that, now that we have some knowledge, how do we cross over to, to, to put that knowledge into practice? Right, yeah. if, well, when my patients say, listen, I really want to come off of medicine. Okay. So I'll say, well, which one do you want? And here's why you're on it. And usually it's a chronic disease. Let's say they're on a sleeping pill and yeah. they don't want to take a sleeping pill anymore. They know it's causing the groggy, not thinking, well, maybe they're falling down now, they're mm -hmm. older. Mm -hmm. I said, well, the first thing you do is have God in your life and ask him to help you. He wants to help you. He wants to be part of this journey. Mm. He wants to give you the power. Beautiful. Okay, and now let's go back to some biblical prescriptions. You know, God made us, when it gets dark, to turn off the lights. Right. So maybe we should turn things off. Yep. I, I was just reading, I gotta jump in here. Yeah. I was just reading a, a town in Scotland that's gone dark, uh, yeah. so you can see the stars and so forth. They're talking to the lady who's led this charge, Moffat, Scotland, and she said, uh, darkness is good for you, too much light is bad for you. Perhaps a simple way to put it, but the principle is correct, right? Correct. You, you, what are you doing with every light in the house on at 1 a.m.? Right, because that changes your circadian rhythms. That's right. Changes the epinephrine and the melatonin in your brain, yeah. so you don't rest as well. Mm -hmm. So no, back to the folks. So you're helping them, and you talk yeah. about the uh, So, so I would the say, I said that would be that. But you know, ask God to help you do this. Turn off some lights. Maybe don't use a cell phone. Maybe turn off a television, especially uh -huh. if you're having problems. The simple things like that maybe will be things that would help, and that's biblical prescriptions. God used to do that. So another thing that might help is, is, is why don't you start getting tired? You know, why don't you get tired so uh -huh. your body feels like rest? There we so go. why don't you do something during the day? And another biblical prescription is to work, take care of the earth, take care of each other. Why don't we do those things and see if that will not help you sleep better? So, so we have all those biblical prescriptions, one after another. You know, God didn't make us to have these gigantic meals and stimuli at night. Right. You know, and certain chemicals that we put in our body um, that rev up our body. Maybe we should look at those and ask God, God, can you help me find something else so I might be able to rest better, so I might be able to age better, so I might turn down these stress-related chemicals, so I might lower my blood pressure and sleep better at night and live longer. What's really interesting, Jim, is what you're saying is learn how better to cooperate with the systems God set up. Yes. These are natural design laws that we were created to live under. Yeah. When we don't live under design laws like the law of gravity, if you jump off, you're going to break something. Right. If you don't live the way our Creator made us, we're going to break down sooner. Yeah. And then when we break down sooner, we have a problem, and then we go this modern medicine route. Though there is a place for that because there's some genetics that are unfixable. Sure. And even if you are out there and you're unfixable, God has a plan for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. So we're learning to cooperate with God's systems, get on God's program. And when you do, you discover maybe God might have known what he was talking about in giving us these systems and these prescriptions. If we learn to follow them, we'll just do a whole lot better. Okay, great. My guest is Dr. Jim Markham. I'm John Bradshaw. More from our conversation in a moment, brought to you by It Is Written. Discover the powerful ways that God is part of the healing process. Go beyond what the media and popular trends say about healthcare and learn from an expert what it really means to be healthy. In his book, The Ultimate Prescription, Dr. James L. Markham explains some of the common misconceptions about healthcare that are prevalent in our society today, how you can avoid them, and how to take care of the spiritual dimension of your health. To order The Ultimate Prescription, call 888-664-5573 or visit itiswritten.shop. Welcome back to Conversations brought to you by It Is Written. 
I'm with Dr. Jim Markham, who's a cardiologist and an author and a television presenter, and he's radio programs and he's online. And I'll tell you before we're done where you can find him online because you are going to want to know more from Dr. Markham than we can share in this, this really rather short time. Dr. Markham, you've been very clear for a man who wrote a book called Prescriptions or Medicines That Kill. You're very clear, you're a practicing physician, a specialist, no less. You certainly believe in modern medicine. You believe in medications when they're appropriate and they're needed, and that's the mm -hmm. place to go. You're all about that. Your emphasis in, in really in cooperating with God as far as you possibly can in, in wellness and so forth. Wonderful. But let's talk for a minute about modern medicine. So, so you, we spoke a moment ago, and you're saying every few years you've got to relearn the trade because of new techniques and new technologies. And back in the day, there weren't even stents, for example. What do you see in modern medicine today that maybe excites you? What do, how's modern medicine moving in a way that really is benefiting humankind? Because yeah. we believe in modern medicine. Yeah. Well, you know, modern medicine is great for replacing parts. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's great for treating symptoms, yep. especially short terms until a person can maybe make some changes so they don't need it. So all of us wear out yeah. okay, at different speeds based on our genetics and the stress we put on those. Let me tell you a story. Well, this is when I first started practicing years ago. There was a pastor and he developed Lyme's disease. Oh, you know, that's, that's a, a tick-borne yeah. disease. But Lyme's disease can also affect the conduction system, the wires of the heart. Mm. Okay? And his heart, because of the Lyme's disease, the wires became incredibly slow. Heart rate in the 30s, and he was going, he, his organs did not generate enough blood pressure to get oxygen and get rid of metabolites. He needed a faster heart rate. Sure. So we have the ability to put in a pacemaker, both a short-term pacemaker, which we put in, to see if he would sort of heal from Lyme disease, which he did not. Oh. It was permanent damage. So we put in a permanent pacemaker and he is alive today, spreading the gospel go. with the pacemaker in it. Yeah, amen. Now, he's yeah. not perfect. Um, I know people that, that just, their, their genetics, they wear out, their arteries get diseased, they start having chest pains, yeah. and they have heart attacks. Well, we could put in a stent yeah. that can help them. Yeah. Now, we want to try everything we can to slow down the progression of disease and reverse it if possible. But it's not possible to reverse disease. We live in a bad genetic. Some people get cancers, yeah. and mutations. It's, it's no one's fault. It's just our genetics, and sometimes it happens. Well, we have modern medicine if we pick up on that early on, mm -hmm. especially colon cancers and mm -hmm. certain types of cancers. We find that. We take modern medicine, sees it. We get rid of the problem, and people are many times cured. I made a phone call to a friend after she'd been diagnosed with cancer and was rather horrified to hear from her. We went to the doctor and they said, I have no hope. I'll be dead in 18 months. And she, she was a picture of health. It was one of those cancers that just come from out of nowhere. Yeah. I'm gonna be dead in 18 months. When I recently saw her, she is alive and well. The physicians are saying, we can find no cancer anywhere in your body. So what happened was, long story long, uh, they sought a second opinion. This is as a result clearly of prayer and faith, but modern medicine. And they got her on a, a regimen that just seemed to work, blew the cancer out. She's doing great. Yeah. You see, that's fantastic. Yeah, and God can use modern medicine to heal. Sure. He can use lifestyle medicine to heal. Right. And for some people, he decides to let them live in affliction. Mm -hmm. Remember Paul? Yes. He could have healed Paul. Yes, and he chose not to. He chose not to for his greater purposes, yeah. but he will heal him in his time. That's right. And that's where our faith and hope and our spiritual part comes in. But yeah. some of the interesting things in modern medicine, yeah. for instance, in the old days, when we had rhythm problems, there's one called atrial fibrillation. Sure. Lots of people get that. Yep. We used to not have much we could do about give medicines, but now we can go up inside the heart, we find out where that rhythm's from, and we get rid of that rhythm by a procedure called an ablation. Sure. The pacemakers, at one time, Alfred Hitchcock had one of the biggest pacemakers in his abdomen, but our pacemakers are very small now, yeah. and we just put them in under local. People usually go home the same day, and that keeps the heart from going too slow, where sometimes, in the past, the wires would get old, just like a car battery, uh -huh. and it would be 
over. Yeah. But now that's a place where modern medicine is very helpful. Some uh, people, yeah. Address this, I apologize for cutting you off there. Address this for me. There's a great deal of mistrust of the entire medical, I'm gonna call it industry. I noticed this among Christians, among conservative Christians particularly. Now there's some reason for that. Yes. I think the whole medical industrial complex has maybe made a few unwise calls which have caused some people to look at them askance. But we ought to be able to have faith, and I think we can have faith in modern medicine, can't we? We can have, I can come to you as a physician and have faith that you're working for my benefit and betterment and that the team of doctors and helpers and specialists around you really want the best me. I'm concerned about people who say, oh, they're all quacks and you can't trust any of them. That's just not right. No, and I share their concern because there are some out there that are in systems that aren't healthy. Right. And we have to realize that that's out there. But at the same time, we have to realize there's a lot of good people sure. that are out there that are wanting to do the best, that are maybe working in a system and a world that's yeah. not perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Some great technology, some wonderful oh, medications. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. For instance, now in patients that the heart valves would wear out. Sure, yeah. Years ago, they got people would get too old, there'd be too high risk for surgery. Mm-hmm. We can now replace heart valves through groins now. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah, both the aortic and mitral valve, we can do that with. Yeah. The bypass surgeries, when arteries get so clogged up where people don't have a quality of life, right. we can now go and do bypass surgery and stents much better than we've ever had before. Mm. Now, of course, we don't want to do that till we have to, sure. but we, we can do that. Yeah. Um, we think about joint replacements. Yeah. We've got so much better than that. Eyeglasses, hearing aids, dental work. You know, if you think about it, there's tons of places. Detection of cancer. Yeah. I mean, there's so many ways that we have improved, but we have to take it on ourselves to do some homework Find out the right providers and right people that we can go to, that we can trust. Talk to our friends and neighbors. It takes good information to make good decisions. Mm. So whenever you have these big health decisions, get good information, pray about it, talk to your families, go get as much good information as you can, and then try to find someone that agrees with your belief system. Mm -hmm. I found out it's very important not to go against the patient's belief systems. I have some patients that say, no, I will never take a medicine under any circumstance. And that's their, their sincerely held belief. Sure. So I explain to them the risk and benefits of that approach. And if they say, no, I'd rather do it this way. Sometimes they're so scared and fearful of going against what they believe and what God's leading that it causes them to have a side effect. Mm, mm, it's a, mm, it's a mm. side effect. Whether it does or not, they believe. Sure. Belief systems are very important. Just like if someone believes they're gonna get better, we call that a placebo effect. Yeah. One third of patients will get better from the placebo effect, even if they're just getting a sugar pill. One day I'm gonna ask you why that is. We don't, I don't have time here, because a couple other things, but What's in the brain, it happens in just, the brain. It's phenomenal, isn't it's, it? It's what the brain does with yeah. endorphins, belief systems, it turns down. Some people don't wanna take a medicine and they take it, it stresses them out. Uh-huh. They make adrenaline and cortisol, they can't sleep at night, they think the medicine's killing yeah. them, and it does because they believe it. So belief systems are very important. And likewise, if they they think a medicine and a doctor and a healer is helping them, yeah. it also helps them sure. to a certain degree. So modern medicine, great te- we have great technology, better than ever. It, it appears to me that by, I'm talking about you here, by, by being willing to look at parts of modern medicine that may not be doing everything right, you're a great believer in balance. Yes. You seem to be. You, you seem to model balance. You, you careful that you don't overdo the meds, but there are going to be times that you may need them in order to save your life. Talk, talk about balance and why that's important. Well, it's important to have balance because you know if you're on a seesaw, for instance, and if you don't have balance, you tip. Yeah. And when you tip, things don't work well. So sometimes in our world that we live in, it does not promote balance. And real balance, I think, again, comes from the scripture so we can see the big picture, what's really important. And as we see the big picture of what's really important, balance becomes a little bit easier. 
then we do things not for ourselves, but we do things because we want to glorify God in all things. Mm -hmm. So we start doing those things. And then it gets a little bit easier because we, we're easy to see where that balance occurs from. We realize our Savior was the most balanced ever. That's right. Ever. You know, he, you know people didn't agree with what things he did, right? He, they didn't say he, he was balanced, but he, he was a balanced yes, he was. Savior. So as we learn that and we grow into it, we realize the world doesn't want us to be that way. Uh -huh. When we're unbalanced, it creates stress, it creates all sorts of problems, and that generates revenue for different people. And, you know, because they try to give you things to help you get rid of the fear and the anxiety. Some people turn to bad habits, mm -hmm. whether it be alcohol or drugs or even prescription medications. Um, and we don't see the big picture. So as we balance ourselves out, we can see things more clearly. And nowadays, John, it's harder than ever to see balance. There's an effect that was studied called the illusory effect, where if you hear something more than two times, even if it's not true, your brain tends to believe it. Oh, so you hear something over and over, and this is the best thing ever. This is the best thing ever. This is the best thing ever. Well, Ad even if it's not true, your brain starts to think it, yep. and it changes your belief system. Advertising works. Yes, it does. Yeah. It does. Hey, tell me about this, because among the things you've written here, look at this, created by cardiologist Dr. James Markham, and it's not 10 steps to have a healthier heart. A set of Bible studies for kids. It's yeah. fantastic. God heals me, my Bible-based plan for health and happiness. How did this come about? Well, I wanted, originally that came about from this Bible study called Biblical Prescriptions for Life. Fantastic. And Biblical Prescriptions is sort of what we sort of wanted to get people into the Bible yeah. as a transformative way to health. Christ is a key to health. That's the real message. So people needed something that was doable, um, some of the big health, and this is similar to other programs out there, but each program, it starts with things that people can do, they can be successful in it, and they do it through the power of a relationship with Christ. Mm. And it goes through, this is a seven week Bible study, it ends in the physiology of worship and how worship itself changes you physiologically and also empowers you. It doesn't start there, we sort of build into that. We start with practical things. Worship changes you physiologically. Yes, and we, now we have scientific studies that prove that. Interesting. Yeah, it changes the part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex. Some people call that the God brain. Mm. It grows it. Mm. And everyone knows when you're in worship, when you feel the presence of the Holy Spirit, your body feels different. Mm -hmm. You have that peace. You have something that, that transcends anything here on earth. And that was given to us at creation. Remember, that's a law that was given to us that yeah. governs creation. God said, listen, I'm gonna give you a time to rest and heal and to acknowledge to, to be holy. And so that is a treatment, and we talk about that in this, as well as other steps. And so, so this is a great tool for people that want to become healthy, mm -hmm. that want to figure out, well, where do I start? Because yeah. some people beat themselves up. You know, of course we can't be perfect. We need a savior, right? That's right, that's right. And we need, we need steps that we can do so we don't beat ourselves up, and this is that. And from that, we said, we need something for the younger generation because we want to start them, train up a child in the way he should yes. go. We want to train them in these thought patterns as well. So that's where we came up with the plan for, for kids, for younger ones especially. And in this world, we needed alternatives to offer them um, something if families want to be helpful. And we have a lot of homeschool people that mm -hmm. like this as, as part of their curriculum. So where can people find these resources? Well, th we have a website called biblicalprescriptionsforlife.com. They can go. get all of these resources, they can order them. A lot of people, these are using these as outreach. Fantastic. They'll go to their friends and neighbors and say, hey, listen, you want to get off of medicine? You want to lose a few pounds? Come to my house and study this with me for seven weeks. Let's become friends. And guess what? They're introduced to the gospel through this. Yeah. And this is made for people that have never thought about health as part of their, or their lives. Biblicalprescriptionsforlife.com. Dot com. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. And if they want to interact with me directly, now that I've gotten a little more time, they can go to my personal email, which is heartwise, one word, heartwise, J-M, Jim Markham, at yahoo.com. And I try to answer each individual's question as well as I can 
without interfering with their doctor or becoming sure. part of their care. We try to get, sort of steer them in the right direction, when to use modern medicine, lifestyle medicine. And more than that, we, we want to pray for them and get them into the Bible yeah. and get them to understand that God is the real healer, not man. Um, God wants to partner with you on everlasting health. Also, for people who want to, who want to watch more of your presentations, yeah we can go online, but tell us where to find you online on YouTube. Yeah, I have a YouTube channel called Biblical Prescriptions for Life that's been very popular, a little bit controversial, oh. but popular. And during the pandemic, people wanted to hear my views on different things. So I've been able to talk about different pandemic related issues, but that's not the real reason we had it, John. Sure. The real reason was to introduce people to biblical prescriptions, to see the big picture, mm. that we're gonna continue to have health issues, health problems, controversies, and we don't wanna be so distracted by the noise that we don't see what's going on mm. and that we don't connect with the real source of healing. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason and God has blessed that. And also on your your station, we, we still have programs where yes, we give we do. information right as here well. On it is written TV. So it's it's out there and I'm easy to get a hold of. And I just want, I have a heart now more than ever to help out whatever little way I can to help people to find true healing in Christ. It's, it's fascinating. And of course, you're not the only physician who's ever done this, but you've jumped in boots and all as a physician using medicine to point people to the Creator who's really the great physician. That's yes. a wonderful thing. Must uh, You'll understand what I mean when I say you must derive some, some tremendous satisfaction by seeing a patient take it a little step further than just a prescription or an implementation of a principle and see that person look towards Jesus. That's got to be very uh, encouraging for you. Yeah, and, and you know, everyone has their ups and downs in ministry. Yeah. You know, you have your critics, you have the people that, that throw arrows at you, and you have, you know, it's, sometimes it can be a challenging path. But when you have someone that's, you know, come to Christ, I, I'm working with a church right now that's just finished this, and I got an email from them the other day, said this has been transformative. They never saw health through a spiritual lens before, and it's just changed my life. Beautiful. And I'm hoping that that will change their life, and they'll use this as, as a tool to let someone else know about Christ and the healing power they're in. But yes, it gives you encouragement and empowerment. Yeah, and what you've been able to do too is take your life's calling and bring Christ into that. Now, physician or otherwise, that is something anyone can do. Yeah. Use your platform, yes. in, in your case it's medicine, for somebody else it's something else. Use that platform to share Jesus. And it might be as simple as a word, a, a, a saying thank you, or just some kind act. It yeah. might be something that's very simple. Dr. Jim Markham, thank you. This has been great, I've enjoyed it. The time has flown by. Yeah. Undoubtedly, lots and lots of people have been blessed. I hope we can talk some more. And I hope so we'll too. We look forward to seeing it's you It's been some a more. good time. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us. What a blessing this has been. Now, uh, remember the, uh, the websites, the YouTube channel, uh, Dr. Markham even said you can contact him directly. This has been fun. Our hope, my hope, my hope and prayer is that uh, you'll find ultimate good health through faith in Jesus Christ and you'll have not only good life in this world, but everlasting life in the world to come. He's Dr. Jim Markham. I'm John Bradshaw. This has been our conversation.